Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Fordham University Show Matches here on tonight's broadcast. We already ended match number one with Rose Hill taking a resounding victory over the Lincoln Center, taking control of the game early and never once letting go of the chokehold. A couple slip-ups here and there, but at the end of the day, they still went home with a massive lead. And now we're going to switch over to the B-side teams, the lower-ranking players who are still looking to prove themselves and find those bragging rights over their counterparts. This time, it's going to be the Lincoln Center in the blue versus Rose Hill in the red. Once again, I'm Captain Flowers here on the casting desk, joined by only King Ramus. And King Ramus, tell me what you know about these guys. I don't know. I All I know is that teams are not as balanced as last game. However, I'd like to point out that all of these guys still have, like, good win rates in their respective leagues which so means that they're they're climbing slowly these guys aren't that bad they're all climbing microphone activated well if we take a look at the bands we're gonna see the volley bear band away we're gonna see echo pretty standard band these days one of the top bands actually nobody likes to play against echo there in the top lane rumble zed caitlin and ezreal a little bit unusual and I don't know anything about these guys. I don't know anything about these players, their champions, their tendencies, what they win with, what they lose with. So everything's kind of going to be a surprise to me. And speaking of surprises, Vi is a champion that I haven't seen anybody play in the longest amount of time. Uh, uh, yeah, Valkyrie's kind of played this a bit. He has a decent win right with it. Uh, let me try to find it. Actually, that's, that's a waste of time. All I remember, he has a pretty good win rate, over 50% with it. And from what I remember seeing from his games, he's pretty good with Vi, so I'm not surprised, it's just a comfort pick. And if you think of it, like these guys just, like the Volibear and Echo Bands, they're like top win rates, top win rates, so you want to ban them out. Other, I think they're just comfort bands, you know, you don't want to play against these champions, you ban them out, you don't want to deal with them. We're going to see Tristana and Braum picked up over onto the side of Rose Hill, and Tristana and Braum work together with a synergy that goes with their stacking abilities. Obviously, Concussive Blows requires four hits to stack all the way up, and Tristana's Explosive Charge is going to get increased damage as she lands auto attacks. So once both of those abilities are landed on a target, you're only getting that much more awesome stacking effect by saving yourself time and stacking them both at once. A target hit by both the Explosive Charge and a Winter's Bite is quickly going to find themselves in a world of pain as Tristana lands auto attack after auto attack with her attack speed enchanted through rapid fire. It's worth mentioning that Prom's passive, when he hits a target, if the target gets hit three other times, he will get stunned for a short period which will let Tristana, the AD carry of this team, the Marksman, deal a lot of free damage to that target that is stunned and this is going to be a key fact for the laning phase will uh the i mean will the enemy bot lane just get stunned will they if they let themselves get stunned it's a lot of free damage they don't want that they want to pick their fights just burst them and get out you don't do not want to take a full launch fight against this bot lane it's scary lucian going to be picked up on the side of the lincoln center they're picking up the maokai as well he's come into popularity recently He's really become a force, once again, in the top lane. The power of those top lane tanks, especially champions that are able to make a lot out of the Sunfire Cape into Iceborne Gauntlet into Spirit Visage meta build have become incredibly, incredibly potent. And it looks like we're going to see Jax and Shivana both picked up, and the odd thing about that, both these champions normally only junglers these days. I'll go ahead and say this is a Shivana top. I, I just want it to be Shivana top because I've played it, and it's a beast. Maybe not, it doesn't take Frozen Gauntlet, however, Titanic Hydra Shivana is really scary. She deals a lot of damage, she works with Sunfire Cape, and she's just a good pickup. But if you think about it, maybe both of the players are at ease with both, uh, with both champions, and they're still figuring it out. Now, I would like to know what you think about that Sona pickup. We don't see it quite often, a lot of people are saying it's coming back as a good pick. What do you think about it? I haven't seen Sona in a while. Sona and Vi, I feel like we're just flashing back to some previous time machine season and we're not actually playing in season six anymore. Because both these champions four. used to have their time in the sun. Both these champions used to be super meta. And for a while now, they've just kind of fallen off the edge of the world. Now, of course, Sona has some awesome early trading potential. She can 
heal up, she can provide a shield, she can provide extra bonus damage. The problem is if your opponents are actually able to collapse and beat her up before she has the time to make that poke and that healing pattern prove really successful for herself and her AD carry, she quickly falls apart. And once a Sona lane falls behind, she's so incredibly squishy that against an opponent that actually has a reliable engage mechanism, like Braum CC, she's just going to start to become free money. So Die Hard and Nasus Loves Bastet have to be very, very careful not to allow themselves to fall behind because Big Cheese and Trilamser, I know I'm butchering that one, are going to be able to take advantage of it if she overextends her boundaries. Yeah, I think I would have liked to see Soraka because it's just so incredibly strong at these points. I mean, it forces the enemy team before fighting. You need to kill Soraka. And if you think about it, like any of those teams, they both have good engage, but it forces them to blow it on a target they don't necessarily want to blow it on. Like both of these teams, especially blue team, they have incredible engage. They have Defy Ultimates, which makes her target a single opponent and just charge to it and smack it down. Maokai has a root, he just jumps onto someone and roots him down. And they have two of the greatest crowd control abilities, the Sona Ultimate and the Annie Ultimate. Which one of them, Annie, summons just a bear, comes down from the sky and stuns everyone if she has her passive up. And Sona has just plays music and everybody dances. Now, I'm going to be interested to see what exactly Shivana is able to do in the top lane. Because Shivana is a champion that's very, very one-dimensional. Shivana runs at you and she hits you and she does a lot of damage. If you're able to resist that, or peel her away effectively so she's not able to maximize the damage from burnout, Shivana's impact in the game becomes very low. If you aren't able to resist it, if Shivana's very far ahead, or if she's up against someone who just doesn't have the tools in their kit to deal with her, she becomes this oppressive force that requires a lot of attention to actually deal with her appropriately. So if Moby's D falls behind, or if he's not able to properly deal with Kiwi's Maokai early, he's going to be useless. Borderline completely worthless in these fights. However, if he gets ahead, as players on a Shivana, especially since this is a lower-ranked game, Shivana's a champion that can do very, very well in lower-ranked games because of the fact that her base damages are so insanely high compared to most other champions. A lot of players who aren't familiar with the deeper aspects of the game don't actually recognize how badly they'll beat her, how badly they'll lose to her, excuse me, in an early trade, and that sets them back for the entirety of the laning phase. So I think a lot of this early laning phase is actually going to come down to Moby and Kiwi's knowledge of the matchup and who's able to play it better knowing when they should be doing what. Now to be fair, I think you're forgetting something about Shivana, and that's her incredible split push. If she does decide to go into Titanic Hydra, and I mean just, in fact, if she just decides to be Shivana in general, she has incredibly good wave clear and is really hard to deal with. And if you think about it, who are you going to send to deal with Shivana? Are you going to send Vi? Vi later into the game will not be able to deal with Shivana unless she's incredibly fed. Because she doesn't scale as well as Shivana. Maokai, I mean, he does have good wave clear, to be fair. However, he is still not able to kill Shivana. So he has to stay there or he loses a tower. So that can maybe... And then if you think about it, what tank does um, Lincoln have? They only have Vi if she goes tanky, but if she goes damaged, they lose their only tank. The biggest problem for running a split push composition is properly executing a split push composition. There's a reason that usually in lower yellows and solo queue, you see the strategy fail. Because it requires superior cohesion from everybody on the team working together, making sure you're pushing up at different points in the map at the exact same time, falling back at the right times, taking objectives when attention is paid to the split pusher, etc., etc., etc. And I don't know, like I say, these players are mostly silver, gold level players. If they're familiar with those kinds of macro level plays, we'll have to see. We're about two seconds away. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be live with the second game of the evening here momentarily.
Welcome back, everybody. We're live with game number two of the Fordham University League of Legends show matches. The first game between the A-Sides teams went the way of Rose Hill in a pretty stunning display of skill and dominance over their opponents in the Lincoln Center. Now Lincoln Center's looking to make a comeback with the B-Side teams, the lower-ranking players seeing what they're able to prove here on Summoner's Rift. I'm Captain Flowers once again on the casting desk, joined by King Ramus. And Ramus, it looks like we might see some level one action. They're staring at each other, they just don't know it. They did, but I guess they finally knew, since they awarded it eventually. And I mean, you, you, you have to know at some point that maybe there's someone, and you have to put a ward and just see, is there somebody looking at me? And that's one thing to keep. You were moved. I think we had a momentary disconnect from the audio there for a second, but we're back. We're going to see what we're able to do with this one. Moby's D squaring off against Kiwi here in the top lane. And the top lane is kind of going to be an example of, I think, this the way that the entire game is sort of going to play out with game knowledge having a big impact on the way this one goes. Yeah, I was going to just talk about it. Just uh, That's a good transition. Uh, yeah, you see Maokai... Uh, he probably played around two Shivanas in his life as Maokai. He doesn't know how to play well against her. However, when you play a champion that is not very known in a role, people tend to not know what to do against it. And I think this is something we're going to see. Just Shivana exactly knowing what she needs to do. And uh, Kiwi just not knowing what to do at all. Thorns of Misery grabbing some damage here in the mid lane onto Aegyo Kimchi nice and early. Now, again, guys, if I'm mispronouncing these, ga these names, you'll have to let me know because a lot of the names are kind of tricky, to say the least. But we'll have to get by with what we're able to do for the time being. Big Cheese and Tree doing what they can here in the bot lane. Die Hard having some early pressure as Aegyo Kimchi in some trouble. One more auto attack might be able to take him down. Flashing forward and dropping the ignite over the wall. Syndra is able to walk away, but she can't get the kill in doing so. Aegyo Kimchi's heal going to keep him alive as now Nasus loves Bastet. Going to avoid the stun coming in from both the concussive blows and the Jax counter-strike. He lives to see another day. He's going to be alive with only 150 HP. And the problem was in the mid lane, when you saw Thorns of Misery extend as far as he did, flashing out of the turret with the ignite, trying to kill the Annie, just like right there. You see him actually find the kill into Valkyros, but earlier Valkyros was farming those chickens right beside mid lane as Thorns of Misery flashes under the turret. If Valkyros would have had the reaction time to flash over the wall and just attack him once, First Blood would have gone the other way. Yes, this is some things that... Actually, when you start playing this game, it's a thing that's not really evident when you think about it, but it's really important. You need to look beside your screen you need to look into your mini map and see oh hey what's happening you need to move your mouse a bit to see oh what's happening next to me because knowledge is power knowledge is power gi joe's catchphrase always reigns true here in the bot lane we're gonna see die hard and nasus doing what they can to maintain lane control cs pretty much gonna be even between these guys but this is the only lane where you can say the CS is even. Look at top lane, look at mid lane. 25 to nine, 27 to seven. Try gonna take a whole lot of damage here in the bottom half of the map. Not gonna be happy with the way that one turned out. Valkyros on the top side, Moby's D in some trouble for the time being, but now it's a fair fight. Now it's a 2v2. Kiwi trying to walk himself away. Arcane Smash gonna buy him some time and everybody disengages this one. Valkyros taking the worst part of the trade. Yeah, we can see that trade really went into uh, Lincoln's favor because, uh, I mean, Rose Hill, I'm sorry. Because uh, that Counter Strike, Jax's ability to stun two players or more, as long as they're near him, is really strong. And he got both of them stunned for a while, which let just Shivana go ham on them. Moby's D really got his time there in the top lane. And he still has. There's a, a whole 500 gold at five minutes just due to the fact that um, Moby's D is just able to kill these little creeps more than uh, our friend here, uh, Kiwi. This game is already a 2,000 gold deficit, despite the fact that it's only one kill apart because of the farm difference. 
9 to 37 in the mid lane, 7 to 39 in the top lane. You know your mid laner's confident about winning the game when he rushes Medjai's Soul Stealer, item number one. Oh, we're gonna see small pose. You know, this wouldn't be. This wouldn't be a normal game if it wasn't. When see, normally pose. we can say it wouldn't be house party if there wasn't a pause, but yeah. it's actually not house party this time, so it actually would make too much sense to say that. Instead. It looks like we're having some sort of a frame rate issue with Thorns of Misery, so hopefully he's able to fix that one pretty soon. Yeah. But you know, it's not it's not an amateur league if it, there's no pause. I mean, it's even LCS's pauses. It's just a thing that happens. It's a tactical pause. They've got to consider strategy, figure out yeah. their next move. Uh, by the way, as you guys know, uh, or maybe don't know, you cannot move your screen or look at something else that what was frozen on your screen as the pause hit. So they can talk to each other as much as they want, but they can't move this tree screen, try to check items and other stuff. That's important, because otherwise, you know, you could do a lot of recon during the pause timer. So 4v5, they're saying, uh-oh, I hope it's not actually a, a 4v5 and he's disconnected for a long time. But stick around, everybody. We'll be right back. The broadcast will continue as soon as we manage to get back into the game once Syndra reconnects. A summoner has reconnected. All right, we're back. The game has resumed. The problem has been fixed. Syndra's back in here, and the game is once again looking to move forward. Oh, yeah. I'm so hyped right now. But it's kind of sad that Lissandra didn't start with the Dark Seal, which built into Magi's, because she would have already gotten, I think, three stacks or so. 
But I mean, I guess now that she has it, she just has to not die. Because if you guys do not know, Magi Soul Stealer, the item that right now Torrents of Misery has, whenever you get kills, you get stacks, which makes you more powerful. But when you die, you lose stacks. So the goal is to kill as many people without dying to be stronger. Thorns of Misery looking for some damage here in the mid lane on the kimchi. Going to be able to find some nice poke. And it's all just about the CS game, really. The farm difference alone is going to decide the outcome of this game as everybody on the side of Lincoln Center is just starting to become gold starved. Sans diehard here in the bottom lane. He's keeping up pretty well. He's only down about five. But compared to his top lane, compared to his mid lane, which are down 34 and 42, these guys aren't having a fun time. They're not going to have any gold to actually come back and be relevant in their matchups either because when they go back to shop, they've got no money to spend. Yeah, right now in the middle lane, uh, I mean, Ego Kimshi and uh, Tords of Misery have a thousand gold disparency, which is huge at 730 minutes. This is huge. Right now we can now see Jax trying see... to come for a gank. Into the bot lane. Jax looking for the gank. Won't find anything. Instead, he just kind of comes down here, flexes his muscles, lets his opponents know that he's there, and he's ready to make a play happen should they afford him that opportunity. But he's just going to go back to farming. Maybe it's all about just showing your face, showing you exist, making them fear you. Again, it's all about sending a message. All about sending a message indeed, and that message is currently we are ahead in this game and we are not looking to give that lead away. Eight minutes in, still 2,000 gold ahead. Try and Big Cheese finding some nice damage on the Die Hard here in the bottom lane, but the heal comes out, negates a good chunk of that one. No real action coming out from either jungler after they had that 2v2 there in the top lane. They're both deciding, you know, I'm just going to sit around and farm. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be, I feel like, a slow game. Because coordinating a team to actually do stuff against another coordinated team is pretty hard. So a lot of the time it ends up just being, oh, hey, uh, we're going to go do this. But we oh, it's not working anymore. I guess let's just kill stuff like creeps to get money. Now, one thing that's a little bit questionable is if you look at the itemization coming out for Vivex, the jacks in the jungle here for the red side, Ooh. he's got a long sword along with his jungle item, which would lead me to believe that he's going to build Warrior. And Warrior is not really the general item that you would build on Jungle Jax. Jungle Jax has such a ridiculous synergy with Devourer that there's pretty much no reason to ever build a different jungle item. So I'm going to be really surprised if he actually goes down that path, and it looks like... We're going to see pause, pause number two. So I guess we can take time to talk about that. Devourer. And the, basically, uh, as you see, the blue item Jax has at this moment, it's called Stalker's Blade. And it's a jungle item, which enhances his smite ability. And you can build it into an enchanted jungle item. And right now, he's looking to go for the fighter type jungle item, which would give him direct attack damage but what a lot of Jax players will do they'll go with attack speed as his ultimate every time he does three attacks he will have a stronger third attacks but with Devourer you attack faster and attack twice sometimes so it's just you proc your ultimate so much you deal a lot more damage this way but it takes more time to get there First Syndra, now Maokai in terms of the disconnect. Wherever these guys are, they must be having some sort of a connection issue. Hopefully they get it resolved soon. Otherwise, what could be a 30-minute game will quickly become a 50-minute game with all this downtime. Ooh, and as you say that, he's coming back. That's all you gotta do, man. You just gotta jinx it. Yeah, I'll always. We, I think us casters always jinx it, and we learn to use the jinx. It's just the thing we have to use, so if I want to say, let's say I want... Let's say I want this minion to die, I'll just say this minion will never die. And of course it will die. Now you see this is not biased, this is totally me just being a medium. You're just about to see it. And bam, there go the minions. Rip poor little minions. Ramus cursed you to death. And we're back live, hopefully for real this time, hopefully till the end of the game. 
and we'll have to see who's able to do what just next. Again, nobody making any plays. Nobody really looking to do anything so far. We might see Valkaros come here into the bottom lane. He doesn't have Flash available. However, with the ultimate he ready is to go, spotted. this could be trouble here for Tree. He's going to be slammed up into the ground. The ultimate's going to land immediately. Glacial Fissure coming down from Cheese in retaliation. Chilling Smite connects. What can they do on top of this one? Valkaros able to find some damage, not enough to actually secure the kill. And despite the fact that they use the Vi ultimate, despite the fact that they've got the Sona ulti there as well, they're not able to find what they need. Meanwhile, topside, these guys looking to go Lumberjack, and his Kiwi walks himself away to safety as well. Yeah, Vivex tried a nice attempt, and it actually worked out. You might think, oh, here Vivex wasted his time going into the top lane. However, he did get uh, the flash of our friend here, Kiwi. And that flash is on a 300 second cooldown, which is a lot of time. That means that for 3 seconds, he is more likely to die. Ego Kimchi doing whatever he can here in the mid lane, trying to hold his own, but you can't hold your own against that. Thorns of Misery finding an easy one versus one pickoff, making that look ever so simple, and it is ever so simple. When you've got that much damage, the Sorcerer's Shoe, the Dorian's Ring, the Magi's Soul Stealer, and all you're up against is a two Dorian's Ring Annie, the damage comes down so very quickly, there's nothing he can do about it, and Thorns of Misery finds himself kill number two. Yeah, and right now, uh, as we talked, to, as I talked about it earlier, Magi's is getting stacked with the kill he just got, and that kill just earned him 20 ability power. That is a lot of ability power for a, just getting a kill. And if he can keep it and not die and keep on stacking it, even if the kill doesn't give as much gold, the reward you get in ability power makes it worth it. Look at the farm, man. 30 compared to 85. 34 compared to 82. Even bot lane's starting to slip further away. 78 compared to 91. Stuff is just looking terrible for Lincoln Center. Yeah, I mean... I, I guess... This is the thing that's really important. If you are new to the game and you don't find yourself uh, winning as many games as you think you should, even if you're playing smart and you feel like your opponent is just stronger, Maybe you should look at your creep score every game because this is something that's really important Even if you play better than your opponent Sometimes just the fact that you have less gold will make it so uh, You are will not be able to compete your, with your opponent and this is a big barrier of entry for a lot of players So if you just take the time go into a custom game kill a few minions You will often find yourself enjoying the game more afterward Agyo Kimchi, the Ignite is burning, and goodbye, Annie. He's going to be taken down for free once more. It's not even a matter of difficulty anymore for Thorns of Misery. He just blows this guy up every single time. No contest, no worry. Pause number three? And pause number two will stop soon as Maokai reconnects. Now Let's stick around, everybody. As soon as this thing unpauses, we'll be right back. But I'm running out of mid-pause banter, so hopefully this one will be done quickly. The broadcast, of course, will resume once your screen no longer has this nice little into Instagram filter over it. A summoner has disconnected.
A summoner has reconnected. We will be going back into the game right now. Third time's the charm, right, Ramus? Yeah, no, no more pauses, please. All right, hopefully we can keep up some momentum on this one. Tree and Bot Cheese lane. looking yeah. for some damage here in the bot lane. Able to find some decent trading potential against their opponents. Nothing really to write home about. Cheese looking to go deep. He fast as Die Hard grabs one kill. Can he find two? Tree says no as Thieves going to drop as well. NASA's trying to get himself away. The explosive charge still armed. That sucker's going to explode. Double kill goes the way of Tree, but he's going to fall for it. It's actually a three for two going the way of their opponents. Lincoln Center makes the outplay on that one, and not so much of an outplay as just so much an overzealous turret dive attempt coming out from Vivex and Tree and Big Cheese. However, I would like to point out that Shivana is in the top lane and she's about to hit that tower really hard. Shivana has a really good pushing ability and as you're gonna see, she's gonna deal a lot of damage. What um, Lincoln should look at doing right now is the dragon. They should counteract with it since they got bot lane. I mean, to be fair, it was only the top laner and the jungler, but they could have done it. Moby's D is just a massive problem right now that nobody on the side of the Lincoln Center is going to have any real answer for. Because of the fact that the guy that normally would be answering on that Maokai, he's so far behind there's nothing he can do from it. Thorns of Misery gonna find one, picks him off immediately, and now this isn't a fight that Kiwi's gonna want anything to do with either. Big Cheese rotates down, throws a couple heals the way of Thorns, and Thorns just walks away with yet even more Magi stacks. Yeah, now he's at 12. The maximum amount of stacks is at 25. And you know how he had 20 ability power before? Now he's at 60 ability power just from getting those kills. Just from getting 3 kills, even if the gold wasn't as rewarding since both of them had died once, he got on top of that 3 ability power. Which makes him right now, if we check, at uh... wait... He's at 163, while Annie's at 55. This is a huge disparity. This means that Annie will deal maybe half of the damage that Sindri does right now, which is a lot. Kiwi trying to save this turret with all his might. He's got his jungler rotating down towards him. Agio Kimchi, one more spear takes him down, and there it goes. Thorns of Misery, unstoppable off the back of that one. Now, despite the fact this game seems so one-sided, there's actually less of a gold difference at this point in time than there was in game one. Yeah, Lincoln are actually doing a better job this game than last one, even though they did put up a good fight. Jax, spinning that Counter-Strike, flourishing the weapon all over the place, won't actually find the opportunity to jump in as Tree and Big Cheese take down their third turret this game. That's going to be the final outer turret falling for the Lincoln Center as they've lost that outer ring of map control and they now have to try to do what they can to prevent their opponents from taking over their jungle. But the takeover has already started. You can notice a couple wards already being placed into the jungle coming down here from Rose Hill as they find Dragon number one for their troubles. Yes, these wards are really going to be useful. Wards are so underrated in lower elo games because you think, hey, that ward doesn't make me deal more damage. Why should I buy it? But actually, let's you see the opponent maybe set up a kill which will let you get more money than what you invested. And maybe Speaking it will let you save a life. Oh god! Thorns so of fast. misery. Insta kills. That that wasn't is, is that a fair fight? I it's mean, absolutely not a fair fight at this point. All Thorns of Misery has to do, what you saw him do right there, it was force of will into Dark Sphere into Unleash Power. That's it. Three abilities, uh, 100 to 0, Kimchi's dead. Good stun Are comes we gonna out, Valkyrie's gonna two? take some damage, Moby's D looking to fly in, what can he do? He's gonna be rooted down for the time being, Thorns of Misery looking to get himself in here, Valkyrie's still alive, Thorns gonna fix that real quick, they managed to get the kill and get Moby's out. Now uh, Moby's can't stay, if he does he's going to be a bit greedy, but that's a still a good pickup, a free kill is a free kill, and even assists give Lysandra free stacks. Now if you can see, I'm not sure if you can on your screen, but that Magi is almost fully stacked. And that means she has 120 ability power from that item alone. 
it has ramped up so much throughout the game and he's just destroying everybody. It's an item you buy when you're incredibly confident that you're going to just win the game immediately and he's shown exactly why he was that confident. Farming up those stacks so incredibly quickly, incredibly efficiently, and of course no deaths under his belt means he's gonna get to keep them for a while. Yeah. But can we can we blame Ego Kimchi? I mean he's playing a I think Annie's a six year old. I, I think we should vote a petition to get Annie out of the League of Legends. Well Many I don't even know what how old is Syndra? Is Syndra like is she like some crazy otherworldly being? Nass is gonna be in some trouble. Speaking of otherworldly, he's going to the next world real quick. Die Hard trying to escape his way out of this one. He will manage to dash out of that trouble using the flash as well. Gonna be a one for zero, going the way of Rose Hill once more, and these guys just have no intention of stopping whatsoever. Pushing down here in the bottom side, Thorns of Misery is able to find one kill, but he's gonna pay for it with his life, despite the fact that he gets himself to that full stack mark. He immediately loses it. Goes right back down to 15. That is so huge because every time you die with that match eyes, you lose 10 stacks out of a maximum of 25. So he just went from 25 to 10 right there. And you only get 4 stacks per kill and 2 per assist. So it's gonna be take a while for him to stack it back up again. That was a big mistake. Well, we'll have to see if Lincoln Center is able to do anything with it. Valkyros trying to dive in real deep onto this one, able to find the initiation onto Tree, but he's immediately CC'd and immediately killed the response. Kiwi's going to be locked down. He drops as well. Two kills now going the way of Rose Hill. As Lincoln Center gets a little bit too aggressive, Valkyros trying to make the play happen, realizing they were in a good situation, realizing that Syndra was not there. Not able to capitalize on it, and these guys got to fall back. Yeah. You can see right there, they thought, oh, hey, we just got Syndra. That's most of their damage. But you need to remember that, that Tristan is also hurting a lot. And even if Moby's D doesn't have a lot of damage right right now, I mean, he, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of kills, not damage. He does have a lot of damage because he is so farmed. 140 CS is a lot of gold. Right now he's sitting on 7.3k gold, which is enough to buy a lot of items. This game is quickly getting out of control, and there's no real way for Lincoln Center to come back in it when you're down 11,000 gold, not even 20 minutes into the game. When you're dealing with a Syndra who has to run into your entire team and pretty much suicide herself and still finds a kill in the process, Valkyros is almost immediately 100 to 0 without even the Syndra ultimate coming out. I think right there, using the ultimate straight up onto Agio Kimchi, no other damage put down onto him, sans maybe an auto attack, is the first time we've seen Thorn's ultimate used and not result in a kill. And that was because that was the only ability used on him. This shows how big the lead is. And right now, that's just going to be an uncontested Baron. 20 minute Baron, no worry in the world. These guys got the Jacks, they got the Shivana, they got the Fed Syndra, they don't care, they're gonna take this sucker down. No problem whatsoever, the wards are up, leading up to the path to it. So they're gonna know if their opponents are ready to try to take that one away. Now I'm gonna be honest, I normally know my stuff, and I mean I know it, I know all the builds and everything. But I can't grasp that warrior build Jax going into probably Titanic Hydra. I mean, I know you're Diamond, which is a pretty high rank, or you are going to be Diamond, at least. Can you interpret this build, trying to define I'm, its I'm strengths? Diamond 5, man. Diamond 5 is a dumpster, let's be honest. Diamond 5 is where dreams go to die. But, uh, yeah, when you look at the build, Warrior just is strictly an inferior item on Jax. Because of the way Devourer works with proccing multiple on hit effects at a time, it actually synergizes even better with Titanic Hydra. So, the only time you would ever go with Warrior, and one thing that I think might be alluding to this is in the fact, you saw somebody mention in the chat, or at least I did, that when this game started, the junglers that Vivex normally plays were either banned or already picked. So he's picking something he's unfamiliar with, so he wasn't super confident in his ability to make Jax work. That's literally the only argument I can possibly think of making for building Warrior over Devour. So is maybe if you're just so, a lack of knowledge? 
It's a lot. Well, the way Devourer works, of course, is you have to farm up the camps. You have to make sure you're able to stack the item and use it effectively. If you don't do that, it's really, really bad. So maybe he was thinking, I'm not super confident. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to farm these effectively. And it just doesn't work out for him. Obviously, his team would have brought up the slack if that was the case anyway. Tree's able to find the kill on the Nasus. There's another kill. Vivex grabbing that one. Looking to find even more damage now. Everybody's dead on the side of Lincoln Center. And just 22 minutes into the game, Rose Hill is going to bash down the Nexus and take the victory. Good game, everybody. GG's in the chat as Nexus blows up. What a wonderful game. Rose Hill definitely showing they are the guys you got to contend with if you're looking to prove yourself in League of Legends at Fordham University. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoyed the games that we're broadcasting. Again, this was Lincoln Center versus Rose Hill, the Fordham University Showmatch Showdown. We had the A side where Rose Hill won looking real strong, and then the B side where Rose Hill won looking even stronger. So Rose Hill now has a title to defend and bragging rights to oh so rightfully use the next time they see their friends on campus. I'm Captain Flowers here for Only King Ramus. We hope you enjoyed the cast. We hope you enjoyed the games and we'll catch you next time.